participation, everyone being here. Thank you for inviting me. I hope I can offer something that you might find helpful and in our conversations as well can help me. I was asked to uh, present my experience in accompanying the Zapatista movement and the Palestine movement together. And so what I'll do is for um, 20 minutes, I'll try to keep it in 20, I'll kind of give a little bit of autobiographical take on how that happened because it's very strange uh, to a lot of people and even people in Palestine, it's very strange to see someone from Latin America there. Uh, and, and then um, I'll talk about what I understand, what I, what I understood from both movements in terms of similarities and, and differences and possibilities. So I, uh, I, I'm also a geographer, uh, like our, my co-panelist, Paul. I was uh, studying, I'm from California, from Guatemala. My family was all undocumented migrants from Guatemala into California in the 70s. I was born, I you know, tried to be a really good student, citizen, the only one in my whole family that has papers or that had papers at the time. And I just wanted to be a very well-behaved kind of person. Uh, knowing that the eyes of immigration, police, the government were always on us. And so really tried not to make any waves. In 1994, I was 15 and I was doing high school things, trying to figure out, you know, adolescence. And I didn't know anything about the Zapatistas until 2003, almost 10 years later, when I enrolled by, there's a whole other story, um, in a geography program simply because I wanted to know why Los Angeles was laid out the way that it was. And I took an urban geography class. It was fascinating, it blew my mind. I didn't know you could major in such a thing. And so then I enrolled in a master's program. And that was the first time that I had even heard of uh, Marxism spoken out loud. My undergraduate was in business and IT because I wanted to get a job in the 90s and the internet was becoming mainstream. And so across, it was the same school, so across campus, in my grad seminars, we were talking about Hart and Negri's empire and Marx. And I was like, is this legal? <laughs> because I grew up in the Cold War and in, in the United States. And it was so fascinating to me because it allowed me in this little tiny corner of geography, which was, it's understood as radical geography, Marxist, feminist, anarchist. It allowed me to really ask questions that I wasn't allowed to ask before. And I ended up doing my master's thesis on transnational migrate, migrants from Guatemala and the United States. And then I moved on to a PhD because I like geography so much. And I wanted to study the Mexico-Guatemala border because it's looking a lot like the US-Mexico border. And that was back in 2003. And I was uh, at the same time also confused, I think like most people in the United States about Israel-Palestine. I knew about Israel because when I was nine, I saw the diary of Anne Frank. I was traumatized. I was happy Israel existed, happy the United States supported it. I had no idea how Israel was created until about 10 years later. And I was so heartbroken. I felt lied to. I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine. And that was all through self-study. I didn't know any Palestinians, any Muslims, any Arabs, any Jews. I'm not from that hemisphere. I'm native Mayan, Mesoamerican from this hemisphere. And so, at the, so it was very strange to me how I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine, doing the self-study, didn't know who to believe anymore. And I ended up uh, finding a guidebook uh, that said, hey, you know, uh, it was a lonely planet because I wanted to visit the Middle East. It was 2005. The US had just gone to war with Iraq, and I already knew by that time that the media, the mainstream media, was lying. And uh, I decided to backpack on a winter break to the Middle East by myself, mainly because I saw there was a Lonely Planet guy that said a little paragraph in the back solo women travelers. I'm like, oh, women can travel, so have traveled solo to the Middle East. Sign me up. I'll do that. And I went, not knowing anybody, and I just went and went to Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Egypt. Israel, Palestine. And I kept an open mind about everything. Uh, I was racially profiled at, in the at Ben Gurion airport in Israel. That really didn't help the case for Zionism. 
uh, as I was trying to question everything. And six months later, the Lebanon-Israel war hit. I was in Chiapas in that summer. I was supposed to be doing my undergraduate, uh, I'm sorry, my pre-dissertation research on the Mexico-Guatemala border, but I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine during this whole situation, six months after my visit to the area, to Lebanon and Syria. And I, uh, long story short, I went back to the university. I kept talking to my advisor about Palestine instead of Guatemala and Mexico. And she's like, you've got to change your dissertation topic or you're not going to graduate. And um, I did. <laughs> and my entire dissertation was on Palestine's borders. And uh, uh, so, and I went there and I lived there for a year and I really kind of just hacked my dissertation. And I had, uh, I, I was so lucky to have an advisor who was so supportive about what I wanted to learn or not about replicating her work like a lot of academic advisors do or replicating her, reproducing her. And I really just went and hacked my dissertation time resources so that I could learn about the Palestinian struggle. I was stunned at how it was still going on for so long, like how they held it down. I had a, um, a radical consciousness um, by that time in terms of the migrant struggle in the US, black struggle in the US, the native struggle in the US. And so uh, I, with, with the Palestinian struggle years later, I can say that the reason why it was so moving for me was because it was the first time I ever saw anybody say no to something that they didn't like or that they didn't want. And I didn't, I, I, I had been raised to not make any waves, to just accept things the way that they were. And so Palestine was the first time that I was able to understand what dignity was. And now I see it in so many other places, but I see it in black struggle, I see it in native struggle, but I didn't see it before. So I'm very grateful for the Palestine uh, movement, people struggle for that, and um, really forcing me to ask a lot of questions that had been very, very uncomfortable to me. And at the same time, while I was doing Palestine work, I started to learn more about the Zapatistas and not just about how they're a movement against neoliberalism that rose up in 1994, but I started to learn about their political theory and their political philosophy, their worldview, like at that level, which I, 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 I realized uh, shortly after and even then that there aren't a lot of places that, that talk about the Zapatistas at that level, like at the level of, of, of world shifting. Uh, of metaphysics. And that was really important to me, especially because in the PhD program in geography, I was learning a lot of political theory and it didn't make any sense. I think some of my professors probably didn't really know that much either. And just we just all were not admitting it. Nobody in the seminar was admitting it. But when I started to read the Zapatista communiques and listen to people who were putting the movement in conversation with uh, political philosophy, political theory, radical struggle, then so many things in life clicked. So then very quickly, and I'm very happy to, um, to talk more about this in detail in Q&A, some things that I realized right away were very similar about Palestine and the Zapatista movement is that they're an anti-colonial struggle and they both under, they've both undergone a peace process famously. And uh, the Palestinian movement um, has been stuck in it. And the Zapatistas were able to unstick themselves through a lot of creativity and a lot of risk and a lot of experimentation. Uh, something that um, is also very, very uh, is similar to both of them is that it's a land question. And I've known that from the beginning, I just didn't understand how deep that was until I started to learn from Palestinian farmers and learn from the Zapatistas, different ways of being with the land. I grew up in California where there's industrial agriculture. That's my community, Oxnard, California. I didn't want anything to do with land, with agriculture, with soil, because I, I thought that that was it. But in Palestine and the Zapati and, and Chiapas, Zapatista territory, I learned about different ways of being with the land and then how necessary it is to have access to land for that, because that's the condition of possibility for the creation of new worlds. It's not just like a, a moral thing about 
that's our land, you took it, now give it back. It's way deeper than that. And I learned that in particular in um, Zapatista territory and the, during the little school where they invited thousands of people from all over the world to come and live with the Zapatista community for a few days. That was in 2013. <clears throat> Some, uh, I will say too, I was also, while I was in Palestine, I did um, a seminar in a refugee camp one summer where we read the sixth declaration of the La Candon jungle, talked about the Zapatistas. I was very surprised in Palestine that a lot of people didn't know who the Zapatistas were, but I had already been surprised in Palestine that when I got there, which was the mid 2000s, there was almost no left left. And that history is 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 very uh, very much shared with the rest of the Middle East. It was the left there was very tied to the Soviet Union. So when the Soviet Union falls and there's no left, whereas in Latin America that was certainly the case with Cuba. Although Cuba was able to continue even after the Soviet Union left, but in so much of Latin America there was a very uh, contentious relationship with the Soviet Union in that that for many movements they felt that the Soviet Union was trying to impose one world on everybody. It's either the first world or the second world, and you got it is going to be imposed one way on everybody. And for the Zapatistas, uh, it seems that when the Soviet Union fell, like for them and for many other movements that were trying to do uh, a left in a different way, it was a, a, a sigh of relief in many ways that the Soviet Union wasn't going to have a monopoly over what an anti-capitalist politics was. So <clears throat> something that, um, that I've tried to do in the last several years is try to build these connections between Chiapas and Palestine. And it's not because the Zapatistas needed it at all. They very famously make pronouncements in support of Gaza and Palestine all of the time. This is the thing that the Palestinian movement um, doesn't really know that much or hasn't in the past. And so I, I took a delegation to Chiapas to attend the little school. Um, and also I've been trying for several years to have some friends to tr translate the Six Declaration into Arabic because there's very little Arabic translations on the Zapatista website. And that was really, it was really exciting in March to see the Six Declaration translated into Arabic and several other uh, pieces. And what was even more exciting about that is I asked around all my friends and nobody knows who did it. So I'm so excited that it's a lot bigger than us, <laughs> those of us that I know. So. There, there's movement around, which is really exciting. And I think that in the last few years, what I've seen, which is different from when I first started accompanying the Palestinian struggle, when I first started accompanying the Palestinian struggle, it was in the very post-Oslo phase where the Palestinian movement had been taught that it needed to focus on its it creating its state and, and or liberating Palestine, no matter where those borders were. But it wasn't anymore an internationalist or globalist struggle like it had been in the 60s and 70s. They had been very, um, very isolated, even from their own neighbors, from Egypt, very famously with the Camp David Treaty, and then uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, like so many of these regimes really couldn't stand the Palestinian movement in the concrete, in the abstract, they would always give a lot of, you know, lip service to it for their own people. And so something that was really um, interesting to see, has been interesting to see, is that what has gone from a, a position from a lot of the Palestinian movement in terms of everybody got their state, we're the only ones who didn't get our state, which is obviously not true. I mean, next door there's Kurdistan, but also so many native peoples don't have a state that's for them. They're under other states. And um, it was a very much exceptionalist kind of movement, at least from the leadership, that this is the worst struggle, the, the, the worst situation in the, war, in, the history, in the world. Everyone needs to pay attention to it. And then not really being able to connect their struggles with others. And that was the situation I found myself in when I first started. And now what I'm seeing is that there's a lot more openness. And at the same time in Palestine, the situation right now, and I'll wrap up with this so we can um, move on to our, our next speaker. Uh, in Palestine, the situation right now, and it has been for quite a while, is that the leadership, the Palestinian leadership uh, is in massive tension with so many Palestinians, whether they're refugees or whether they're in Gaza, 
uh, in, in the West Bank or in uh, what is now Israel, 1948. Uh, Palestine is what it's called, 48 Palestine. And so um, what many people on the ground have been saying for at least the last decade is that the next Intifada, the third Intifada, the, the third uprising of the Palestinian people is going to have to be against their own leadership. And so then this, this is an opening to start thinking more about movements in terms of like how Palestine, it's about all Palestinians or as the Zapatista movement is an organization with a membership structure and accountability. And, I, and, and so, you know, we can be Zapatista in heart or through ideology, but to be an actual Zapatista, it's not that they don't allow just any Mexican in just because they're in Mexico. Like the, the ideology is, is, is really central and is accountability and and work so it's very different from a political party in that way it's very different from a nationalist movement like the palestinian movement it's very different from saying like the black liberation struggle which can uh, for sure there are many very shared oppressions but in terms of so then what to do that there's so many different ideas and that's the case with palestine whereas with an organization like the zapatistas and i think a lot all of us can learn a lot of us can learn about that as maybe a question that we might want to have, like the, the, the building of a collective, of an organization with accountability, with um, shared ideology in order to move forward, uh, rather than like in my case saying the migrant struggle or in my community, the black and brown struggle. Um, those, are, those are some of the lessons that I take away from my experience in in Chiapas and Palestine. And, and one final, final thing, because uh, I think it's so key, a huge lesson I think Palestine has for us is, you know, both Palestine and the Zapatistas are very centered on dignity. I see it everywhere. You see it, you feel it, they feel it, they teach us. And what Palestine has taught me is the importance of any movement that we create is that we do not become the monsters that we're struggling against, which sadly is what the Jewish liberation movement moves towards in choosing Zionism as it's one of its many options. That's the one that it chose is to be together with empire. And so how do we not replicate that? And the Zapatistas, uh, what, they, what they, the inspiration that they bring to me and to I think many people is we're gonna experiment with something else. This, the question of domination is so key with them. They, and, and they don't see it in this dominant world. They don't see a possibility for a politics without domination. And so they say, maybe we just need to go create another world where many worlds fit. And I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs>